Stages of labor. Here we go. Your patient is going into labor. How do you know what to do? You're the nurse. Let's talk about it real quick. This is probably like one of my favorite videos. I can't wait to do this video because like, you know, stay awake at night just like thinking about... No, this is... <laughs> this was a request, okay? So I didn't decide to do this video. <laughs> All right, so for our first stage of labor, we have your patient who knows they're pregnant, they have their due dates, and they're like, okay, I know it's right around the corner, and then all of a sudden, boom, their water breaks. And they're like, holy crap. That's when they go to the ER, and that's when they go call their um, L&D doctor or whatever. They can, usually we find them in the ER, and then we rush them up to L&D. There's a few things we have to do in terms of our assessment of our patients and a few interventions in first stage, but that's it starts with the dilation of our of our <laughs> of the actual cervix. So in terms of anatomy phys here, this is a really bad picture by the way, but this is our patient's thigh, their buttocks, bladder, uterus. Uterus is where the baby is being made. Our cervix, this is what we're talking about, the door to the opening of the baby. If the baby's coming out, we're trying to get our patient to 10 centimeters, and 10 centimeters basically would help the baby to come out even better. So this is the goal of stage one. The last portion is our transition stage. We go through all these dilations here. We have our latent, our active, in our transition. And this is this is the main reason why it takes so long sometimes when you hear patients are in labor and they've been in labor for like 12 hours or like 17 hours. It's because this stage here is taking a long time for that cervix, that door to dilate for the baby to come through. So from the start of labor to full dilation, and aphasement of the cervix. So basically, fancy words for the cervix is getting bigger and bigger, and it gets dilated to its maximum at 10 centimeters, and that's when we can pull the baby out. Now, there are certain few things that go along with uh, assessing your patient and doing the right interventions in the first stage. A big, big one is make sure you're monitoring the fetal heart rate, as well as the uterine contractions. You have two like ultrasound things. It looks like two big belts with like a big belt buckle. Um, and you have like these little waves that almost looks like a, a cardiac rhythm. And we're gonna go over how to interpret those. But in stage one, we wanna make sure that our fetal heart rate, the heart rate of the baby is going up, okay? Nice, smooth, up and down waves. If we have what's called late D cells, basically the fetal heart rate is going down, down, down. Uh, it's not a good thing, and that's a medical emergency. Because if the fetal heart rate goes down too often, this is our late D cells, not enough oxygen's getting to the baby, and the baby could die. So that's where we give our emergency C sections in our stage one. Okay? In terms of the mom, remember you guys have two patients here. You have the little baby and you have the mommy. The mom is going to be hyperventilating. <laughs> All that Lamaze practice. She's gonna be freaking out. So your book might say, she's gonna have some psychosocial, psychological issues here. She's gonna be having high anxiety. No, she's gonna be grabbing your, the husband, grabbing everyone, throwing things at the nurses. I'm kidding. But um, you know, uh, maybe you might watch out. You signed up for this job, right? Okay. <laughs> so, um, so hyperventilating, she's going to be blowing off a lot of her CO2, carbon dioxide. And if you watch any of the ICP videos, intracranial pressure, we know that CO2 is that acid we breathe out. Too much CO2 dilates our um, cranial blood vessels. Without CO2, we have a constriction of our cranial blood vessels. So not enough oxygen's getting to the brain. So our patients pass out. And that's why when we hyperventilate, we can pass out. So just watch out for your patients passing out, breathing too hard. You can give them a paper bag, or you can put some oxygen on them, tell them to relax. Now, thing, a medication that helps us to um, 
accelerate through the latent phase to the transition phase. Let's say you're a doctor. We've been in this phase stage one here for the last eight hours. And the doctor's waiting around, waiting around. And the nurse keeps on coming back saying, it's only five centimeters. We're going to give your patient Pitocin. And Pitocin helps with the contractions. And it helps with your patient in terms of getting them to stage two full dilation. So I've seen doctors do this because they're like, I have liquor tickets, courtside seats, I need to give them more Pitocin <laughs> to get this baby out. And I'm not kidding you. But um, yeah, you'll see a lot of things once you're a nurse. But you'll see Pitocin given, and that's for stage one here. So let's go into stage two in terms of full dilation to birth of the fetus. Second stage of labor is when we have full dilation to the birth of the fetus. So fancy words for we've hit the transition phase in stage one, we're 10 centimeters. Pitocin did the job, we're gonna make it to that Laker game. And <laughs> the, uh, 10 centimeters, it's fully dilated. And now the fetus is coming out. And we're talking about vaginal births here. So if you're barely studying about OB um, and labor and delivery, we're not talking about C-section. That's a whole different route. It's a big different side street there. We're talking about vaginal births. So with our delivery of the fetus, we're going to have a perennial uh, perineum that's bulging. A lot of, um, what is it called, circulation going to the perennial area. We have a big dilated cervix, the opening of the uterus. And we have something called crowning. Crowning meaning that the baby's head is coming out of the uh, vaginal opening. So we're going through the canal here, and the baby is coming out. And hopefully the baby's coming out head first. Hopefully it's not coming out feet first, or hopefully we don't have a um, placental cord, the umbilical cord, coming out first. Because those are different complications that can uh, disrupt the uh, delivery of the baby. For instance, your baby can aspirate uh, some uh, amniotic fluid. Your baby can, um, what is it, uh, have meconium staining. Fancy words for defecate inside the little amniotic fluid sac and breathe in its own poop. That's not good, and actually that is one of the main causes for brain defects and lifelong scarring. So as it's coming down this birth canal, a big uh, indication is crowning, bulging perineum. We're gonna note the time of delivery, and that what leads us into stage three of labor, the birth of the fetus to the delivery of the placenta. That's stage three. Now, one last thing before we go on from stage two is this is where our STDs become very, very uh, important. Because if your patient has any STDs that can be harmful to the patient, this is where your patients can go blind. Your patients can have defects on their face, all because they pass through a canal that has, has STDs. So big, big, lifelong, detrimental risk factors for a little baby that's coming out. So third stage, our birth of the fetus to the delivery of the placenta. We have um, a delivery of the baby. The baby's still attached to this big, long cord called our umbilical cord. And then the placenta comes out. Now, I was a medic, EMT. And we could actually deliver babies, which is amazing to me, in like a six-month course, right? And uh, we would deliver the baby. We had like all these questions that we asked the, the mother. When I got to nursing school, I didn't know any of this because we didn't really focus on it. We just were worried about saving the baby's life. So the baby would come out. In third stage, we'd lay the baby down just in line with the vagina, clamp the umbilical cords, and wait for the umbilical to stop pulsating, then you cut the cord. I'm not sure if your nursing school makes you know that, but that is a big, big, um, big, big uh, thing to know, I guess. So we wait for the cord to stop pulsating. We do an APGAR score, which just um, 
does the appearance, pulse, the grimace, and the uh, reactivity of the baby. And we'll do a whole video on that. So we just want to see how the baby uh, is doing when it comes out. It's almost like a head-to-toe assessment really quick on the baby. Then we're going to take the baby, keep it warm, give it to mom, deliver the placenta, and then that's where we go into stage four, our postpartum period, where our biggest concern is skin to skin with the little baby and mom, but our biggest concern is not the baby itself. We already did that in stage three, APGAR. We're going into stage four where we want to make sure mom's not bleeding out. We have a huge cavity that's open here. And all this activity is coming straight out into prime time here. And we want to make sure that the baby is safe. That's good. But the mom itself has a big, huge uh, risk for bleeding out. Fluid volume deficit. Too much blood loss. So we want to make sure we're, we're massaging this we're massaging this fundus. This fundus is just like a big muscle. I don't know where, a bladder right here. We'll just say it's right here somewhere. We're massaging the fundus, and we have to massage the fundus so that blood will clot and we stop contracting and getting rid of all this blood. So we massage the fundus for about 15 minutes, for about one to two hours, and then we're doing assessments, where we're doing um, assessments for checking about lo lochia that and lochia. remnants of the placenta, the remnants of the blood, we're trying to make it all clot. And the lochia is just that remnants. So the fundus is that top of the uterus, we're trying to massage it, we're checking vital signs, we're making sure that your patient does not bleed out, your mom patient. So every 15 minutes, we're going to massage the fundus, see how the fundus is, we're going to check lochia, and we're going to check vital signs to make sure your mom is not bleeding or too much excessive blood loss. Okay? Cool. So let's go on to the next one here. We have analgesia and anesthesia.